would like to start with a question to um, hopefully all of the presenters, uh, because there are a lot of similar themes, threads that kind of run through through all of the talks that uh, we've heard now. And, and I would like to start with a question which also puzzles us a lot here in this institution, and this is the question of uh, categories, categories and uh, subjectivities that enter into the, the research, whether you do it as a media scholar, whether you do it as an artist, uh, cum practitioner, whether you do it as a media archaeologist. Um, what would be your take on the categories? What are the categories you are working with? Are you trying to distill some of the notions that are used, so, sort of ethnographically, that are used by the participants at the time, or you find it more productive to introduce new um, semantic fields that might not have been conceptualized as such by the participants, but which nevertheless allow us to look at a material in a new way. No particular order, please. So whoever would like to jump in, please. Or you can use this mic. Um, yeah, uh, I think it's a combination of both, probably. So, um, you know, w when I'm first sorting materials, I'm probably trying to stick as far as possible to the materials themselves and use the actor's own categories. But then when I actually decide what is it that I'm telling as a story, then obviously I have my own language and, and categories which are derived, you know, usually from some larger theoretical debates in media and communication studies, so inevitably I translate. But I think if I were to think from the point of view of what would I need when I do research in an archive, I'd probably want it to be as close as possible to the materials themselves, um, although that might be tricky in itself. So I'm, I mean, just to give you an example, I'm currently still struggling with the choice between socialism and communism which is very fraught with various ideological decisions as well, but it, it's a key one for my current project, yeah? So, <laughs> how do you call the period? Is it socialism, state socialism, communism? Oh, there. <laughs> Did you want to? Yeah. I, I agree that it is probably both. Um, one, regardless of what I said, for instance, the archive that I usually work on, which is my archive, <laughs> because it's really full of material. It turns out that it, it does tell a story. There are three major stories that I see in the archive, and they give me conceptualization. And this is the story of conflict, the story of elections, and, and um, um, I usually take the concepts from that. But th then there is another approach. I uh, maybe there will be time in the break. I brought a short film. I know, I know this is a room full of artists and practitioners, and this is a very modest video that my students produced when we completed the archive, and they are undergraduates. And then I was thinking, maybe they see something else in this material that I don't. Maybe the fresh eyes will give me a new insight and new concepts. And if, if you would like to see it, I, it's eight minutes, so you can see it, how someone who was barely born then, uh, sees and reads that archive. So um, I'm also thinking that um, we need some distance in order to reconceptualize the archives. We, when I, say ne when I say we, I mean those of us who want to see the coincidence of the archival or the material uh, from the time and the time of existence. I think it needs a different reading with different concepts as well. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, okay. Um, well, I tried to explain this uh, in, in the presentation. The main criteria for us in, in dealing with this project is memories of us as subjects, and, but also like our generation. Because when everything started, uh, when the conflict started, but also time before that, we were around 12 years old, 11 years. And we start from that. What do we remember? 
and mainly we realized at the beginning of the, the project that was actually media images that we remember on the conflict and what was going on in, in, in that time. So there's no criteria whether it's a uh, direct stream uh, broadcast or it's a popular serial or Eurovision song or, you know, football game. But we start from that and then the research continues in like uh, reading about it and developing uh, further research with uh, compar comparing it with other images and so on. So, but the basic thing is memories and how they correspond with the media images back then and also to the today's situations. Um, well, speaking for myself, I have uh, quite a different experiences toward uh, TV material. As for uh, the material I was speaking here, I was speaking here about uh, student protests, in a way, they wa it was, wasn't used a as a historical source. I used that as a part of different sources used within a field work. Uh, I was watching television, taking notes, um, uh, taking jots and trying to find out what kind of narrative is unfolding between, in front of our eyes. So in, a, in that way, in, in that the first research, uh, I wasn't even recording anything. I was just, just watching TV and writing notes and treating the, the, that TV narrative as any other narrative that was happening and uh, I was approaching in the field. At the same time, I was in the street, watching what is happening in the street, and also trying to make connections between what was narrated on TV and what was happening on the streets in relation to TV coverage. Um, the uh, other, other case in which I use TV material, it's happening at the moment. I am analyzing one of the most popular TV uh, serial, uh, serials in, in former Yugoslavia, Pozorište u kući, theater at home. So I'm approaching that material in this, in this way as a classical archival source. And uh, when I do that, I'm again trying to um, grasp the ways the actors um, are um, defining the categories of experience they are going through. And starting from that, I try to, to make a dialogue with, the, with theory, with literature, and then I'm going always back and forth between what is our, my source or our sources and what are theoretical questions and uh, uh, interesting points, interesting questions with which we entered the research. Thank you. Please. Yes, thank you. I have one more theoretical question for Sabina. Uh, you were speaking about the connection between the media and nationalism and how we are supposed to analyze or give some suggestions about this connection. So I wanted to ask you whether the stress on the cause and consequence relation when we are speaking about the media and nationalism is the right model to analyze this relation because uh, I, I know that it's a difficult after the imagined communities by Benedict Anderson not to have this relation into account but if we if we have into consideration that discourses and media discourses come from a decentered perspective that they don't have clear cause or a clear effect. What is your suggestions? Is there another model that we should approach this issue? From? And also, what is your suggestion about how to analyze a network of bias discourses when we have several televisions who are all spreading biased information? What is the criteria or where is the Archimedean point where we get out of this discourse? Yeah, I've, I've, been, I've been struggling myself with these, you know, causal relationships, but I think um, there's still value in keeping an eye on causes, but then understanding that they are not flowing in one direction. 
Um, and this is really one of the things that I would like to work on a bit more in, in my future research, trying to understand how causal processes operate over time and how, how sort of you can see parallel causal processes happening in different places or through different sectors of society and then how does those parallel processes as well interact with, with, with one another. Um, so I think the, the, the main step is really to step out of this you know, preconceived notion of one cause and one effect. And then as, as soon as you understand that there's a multiplicity of causes going in different directions, then I think you know, you're getting closer to what is actually happening on the ground with media in particular. Um, and your second question was about you know, how to deal with these different multiple perspectives. I think I tend to, you know, I guess when I was approaching this as a student, I was very concerned with the epistemology so far of, of what I'm doing. Um, and you know, trying to, to think about where, where am I as a researcher and can I step out of all these biased representations. But I think ultimately what you need to understand is well, how, do e how does each of these um, you know, biased representations operate and how they interrelate. And I think that by definition will set you outside because you're approaching it as an anal analyst. Yeah, if, 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 if this is making sense. Um, it depends a little bit on your question as well, what you're trying to get at, yeah? So I think as long as you're not, you know, too obsessive about, uh, you know, trying to get out and being at the point of truth, so to speak, uh, to, to, to deconstruct everything. Um, and again, I think questions of causality might help here, yeah? So rather than saying, well, what's the truth, say, what is it that that truth is represented in a particular way? So I think this is how you can get out of, um, you know, the, the tangled relationships of, of uh, truth and, and reality, which I don't think necessarily get you far with media. In this respect, you would accept a relativistic epistemology concerning truth? No, no, <laughs> absolutely not. <laughs> but we can, I think it's a complete, uh, we can probably continue. I have perhaps a follow-up to Ms. Michel as well, but a lot more practical. Uh, you mentioned that in your work you did theoretic, you did analysis, but you also did audience research. And I was wondering, uh, of course, in, in some ways, the re audience research will point out some places where you are looking at the wrong material, perhaps. But was there a connection for you? How did the audience research that you did uh, affect how you interpreted and did it at all? Wh whether there was a change in the way that you looked at the material? Thank you. Yeah, I, th I, think, um, I think what the audience research did for me in this particular project was really to, to think more of television not as a succession of programs or even an individual program that I was personally interested in, but as, as a kind of broader experience. I mean, you can think in terms of flow that you know, people interact with over the course of their everyday life while they're doing various other things. And I think it's understanding this place of particular broadcasts in this current of everyday life that really changed the perspective for me. And understanding also the materiality of television, that the fact that you, know, you watch particular programs no matter how gru gruesome they are while you're playing with a kid or while you're having a meal. Uh, and this, I think this is really crucial in understanding how television operates as uh, a part of everyday life, uh, if that helps. Um, I think it's very important to include the audience, and if I can just add that the, even the recent comparative studies of communication systems, of media systems, are including audiences because now audiences are fragmented and by their preferences and choices, they feed back into the system and reshape the system, which was maybe not so visible in the time of 90s and the time that probably you are posing your questions about the multi-discursivity of the media. But um, uh, audiences do um, change the course of communication, which we tend to forget, especially if we use this causal relationship and if we neglect the fact that television is about politics of representation, not reflection. And for instance, I was entirely surprised when I was 
backwards reading my, the archive to realize how important the story, which I call this, the um, history of disobedience in Serbia was important and was completely buried at the time, and even especially in the external reading of the situation in Serbia. I ended up with uh, junks of programs uh, from 90, 91, 92. Every single year there were huge protests, uh, um, or let's say miscommunication with the official communication, which was uh, completely neglected because we followed the major line of do dominant communication. The same thing happened when the trial, when the bro direct broadcast from the Hague Tribunal became very popular all over ex-Yugoslavia. And I was always wondering why, was, why were these programs popular? Who was watching them? Were they, was this the only way to see your heroes who were sent to The Hague and you had no more contact with them? Or were people supportive? Or were they repulsive? Or did they reinterpret the message? But we never did the, uh, and, the, and the programs died, for instance, because everybody concluded that they did not have, they did not fulfill the political purpose. It didn't, the, the tribunal didn't either, but <laughs> who cares? And, and I think now, it, especially from a distance, if we can do something from a distance, it would be very, very important to include the audiences. Yeah, and I believe the, the question of the audience is indeed very rich and cannot be exhausted uh, by this um, rather short time we have for discussion, but it's very important to indeed conceptualize audiences as active uh, agents, and I think that connects us very well to the next uh, panel, which will follow after the coffee break, which will deal with uh, exactly questions of using, reusing, and performing the archive, and that will also engage a lot of audience questions. So I would like to thank you all, thank our presenters, and... Um